Welcome everyone to our webinar on retrofitting traditional homes. Thank you for coming. So for anyone who isn't already familiar with CAFs, this next slide illustrates some of the things that we're doing to achieve our vision of a zero carbon Cumbria. So it's not just low energy buildings and retrofit, but also energy generation, transport, and community projects which look to improve sustainability in a range of ways. So today, on the next slide, we're going to start with a quick poll um, and then I'll hand over to Emma to introduce the panel and say a little bit about rebuilding together. Emma's going to introduce each member of the panel and invite each one to give a short presentation or answer a few questions. And after that, we'll open up to Q&A. So please start any, adding any questions that you would like to put to the panel into the Q&A. Do that as we from now on. We're going to try and group these questions together under similar themes and Emma, Emma and I will then invite the panel to respond to each group of related questions. At 8.20 we'll start to draw the webinar to a close with our second poll, further events and so on and finish at 8.30 p.m. So without further ado I'm going to start the next poll which is also the questions are on the next slide. So there we go. I hope that people will now be able to see the poll. And it's only two questions, so only two answers needed. And this will give us an idea, the first question will give us an idea of the level of expertise already in, in the audience, so that we've got a sense of how many people are very experienced with this and how many people are um, really at the beginning of their um, investigations into traditional buildings. Okay, so I'm seeing quite a lot of people now have answered. I think nearly 70% have voted. Got a few, give a few more minutes, a few more moments anyway. Okay. I think I'll bring it to an end now. We've had a minute. So the, the poll results show that for most people, um, the more common aspect is I've done some research, a few people it's completely new, totally new subject for them and uh, a few people have got a reasonable level of experience and some people know quite a lot but they want to get technical questions answered. And on the second question, um, again, the, the people, most people have said they are wanting some advice and plan to retrofit in the next two years. Uh, some, a very small number have got the advice they need already. Um, quite a few people are thinking about a retrofit or just curious, maybe get, want some advice and decide what to do next. And a small number have also started work on site already. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'll just show those briefly for you. And I think we can now move on to the next slide. Thank you, Rick. Are you able to move on to the next slide? Not letting you at the moment. Okay, does it let you now? Oh. Does that let you now? Hang on. Yeah, there we go. So Emma, over to you. Thank you, Tina. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Emma Greenshaw. I'm one of the project managers at CAFS and for the last four years I've been managing the Rebuilding Together project. Um, I'm just going to introduce the rest of the panel uh, to you all. Uh, we also have James Innerdale who is a conservation architect and SPAB scholar with us this evening. Chris Morfitt who owns and runs Lake District Lime and um, is also the co-owner of 33A Chapel Street, a property that we'll introduce you to later this evening. Um, Ilias Ugamanides and Penny Randall from Ecological Building Systems are also with us. And if we move on, adding their expertise to the panel on the next slide, are uh, also Tina Holt, who you've already met this evening, who's CAF's project manager of the Cold to Cozy Homes project. James Woolgrove, one of our building's auditors, 
and Phil Davis, who is in the throes of retrofitting his own home with his wife and architect, Katie Lucas. So I'm going to hand back to Tina to introduce what she does and the services that CAFs can offer you as retrofitters. Thank you, Emma. So um, CAFs has both free and paid for energy services. The free services are called to Cozy Homes Cumbria, where we give basic energy advice via a phone call. And this includes signposting for insulation boilers, also debt advice and other local assistance. Um, the other element of our free advice that we can offer are short general advice phone calls on a specific question. So if you've just got a small question on PV or external wall insulation or whatever it may be, you can also call us to get one of our um, advisors to call you back and have a short conversation, which will help you with a small amount of a small question that you may have. And we also, of course, carry out webinars and other events like this one. On the paid for side of things, we have what we call our home retrofit planner, which is a new energy audit service where we model the heat loss scenarios for a house. We can do cost improvements and create a whole house plan. And in a moment, James is going to say some more about that. Um, we have thermal imaging services to detect issues and so on. And we have uh, other levels of energy advice as well. And we will be running some more training courses in the not too distant future such as the ones we've run in the past on home retrofit for energy efficiency. If you go on to the next slide, thank you, Rick. And the latest news hot off the press is we're starting a new project called Retrofit for Cumbria. It's a two year project starting in May and we're aiming to help 35 households through the process of deep retrofit. So if you would like to be involved with that or you'd like to know more about it, do get in touch with us. This is a very new project, um, but we're very excited about it. So, but before I say, I won't say any more about that now, but over to James Walgrove, who is going to talk to us about what the Home Retrofit Planner is involves, as he's one of our team of energy assessors who carries these out. And he's also doing a retrofit, about to start a retrofit on his own home. So he'll be, he'll be doing it um, hands-on as well as um, giving advice to lots of, lots of, people around Cumbria who are trying to do their own homes as well. Thanks Tina. Thanks, Tina. Just for I'll start off by just Tina gave me sort of three or four questions to answer and um, the first question was why do people get the audit? So in answer to that question I thought I'll go back to records because one of the questions we always ask you when you come and have a home retrofit audit is why do you want it? And the top three answers are reducing carbon, making my home more comfortable and saving money. We've got other reasons as well, things like improving my health or improving the air quality. But those three are really up, up at the top and it's often making the home more comfortable is fairly near the top. So that was the first question you, that you asked me, Tina. Then you asked about why getting the audit the audit is helping people to put together the list of how to develop the whole home package not just looking at oh let's just do this and then we'll just do that and then we'll just do that very much the way i used to work mm -hmm. and i've worked on this house and have had to redo things because one thing conflicted with another thing and etc so the audit helps to put the plan of works together in the right order so we don't have to redo work. It's also thought through and costed. So the next question Tina asked me was what's it involve? We always start the audits off with a virtual visit. We're meeting over Zoom and talking about what it is you're wanting out of your audit, what you want from your home. What it, are there any problems which you want to solve at this point? Are there, any, are there any plans you have for future works which need to be built into this audit? So all of that happens at first and it's really useful if you've got some photos and plans available so that I know what period of home I'm looking at and what shape and things I'm looking at at that point. And then we get more real. I come on site and I actually go to your home and measure everything, it, or it certainly seems like I measure everything while I'm in your home. 
and take lots of measurements and that allows me to build a model when I get back to the office which gives us a baseline on your energy figures. We also ask you for copies of energy bills so we can work out how accurate our model is and we aim to get that model as accurate as possible to reality of your own home. Once I've done that measuring, I do some more chatting. At this point, we normally chat out in the garden because of COVID, so we can, we can have a chat outside. And then I come back to the office and I enter all those measurements into the computer, build the model and calculate the baseline energy figures. At that point, that's when I really start to scratch my head because sometimes with traditional buildings, the models don't quite match the reality and we have to work out where things need correcting and correct that. And then I put it away for a day or two while I think about your house and what on earth I can do to improve its efficiency. And then we draw up some different scenarios for the building. So that we start off with scenario one and work through to scenario three. Normally they're sequential. I've done a couple where people have said, actually, can you just give us working down this route and actually working down that route? So we've had scenario one and two have been going down one route and then scenario two, three has gone down a completely different route. But it's possible to do that. Um, the system then produces a very detailed report about what you're getting out of the home, what you're putting, what the financial Im implications would be for buying the works and what the savings should be from the outcomes. And uh, the final question that Tina asked is, how much does it cost? And we start this service at £600 and your best bet is to phone the office because depending on your, the number of rooms and the size and the scale, there is a sliding scale and the office can tell you and I, a lot more accurately than I can. So I think at that point, I'll hand back to you, Tina. Tina's muted, so I'll just step in there. <laughs> Thank you, James. Thank you, Tina, as well. Um, let's move on to someone who's actually doing their own property. Phil, I wonder if you could share with us where you're at, the type of property that you're retrofitting, and uh, where you're at with it, and would you recommend this for DIYers? <laughs> Uh, thanks, Emma. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, we a couple of years ago, we took over a um, 19th century traditional farmhouse um, just near Penruddock on the A66. Um, you'll see from the top left um, picture there that it had a 1970s makeover. Um, so it'd been covered in, um, in cement uh, render and uh, plaster uh, and, and um, a gypsum plaster on the inside. Um, luckily, the um, jackdaws had really taken to it. So they nested in the chimneys. The chimneys had become blocked. The chimneys then had become wet. Uh, all of the plaster work had begun to blister. The walls were wet. The house was freezing cold. Um, and, uh, and that's where we started from. So the first thing we did was to, to, to take off all of the gypsum and start the house to, to breathe. Um, as Chris and his team at the Lake District Lime uh, will um, explain later on, we then went through a process of sort of, I guess it's deep retrofit using sustainable materials. Um, my wife, Katie, is an architect, so she points, I dig and obey. Um, the, our aims really for the house is to, to get something that's warm and, and breathable in, in, a, in a sort of create a natural environment and to, to use local sustainable materials which have as low an embodied um, carbon as possible um, uh, and actually looking at some of the other materials modern materials um, we're, we're a little bit dubious about using them so um, you'll see there bottom right um, there's Johnny one of the Lake District Lime um, team we'd put in a geocell um, insulated floor um, we put in some uh, some uh, underfloor heating pipes. There's a lime screed going on there. Uh, my wife Katie, Katie has taken all of the old lime off the front of the house and re, um, repointed that. Um, 
we, if you go on to the next slide, please, um, Rick. Um, so Chris and his team have been putting on a um, um, some insulated lime, hemp, and perlite, uh, uh, some plaster on onto the walls, um, onto the external walls. We're using uh, sheep's wool insulation internally and in the loft. We are parging the roof, so it's got a lime um, uh, a lime parge or a lime sealed roof. So we've been doing that. Um, our our windows, which we're all having remade, are at Dacre, so just three miles away. I've included a picture here of um, a friend, Ben Davis. We, we've got a number of trees on the property that, that had to be felled for one reason or another. So we've, we've got those milled by a mobile um, saw. Um, those will be going back into making floors, uh, shutters and so forth. Currently, we're just looking at the, um, the plant room and putting in a ground source heat pump. So next week, we will be digging the ground source heat pipe loops. Um, we did a deep, deep, deep search into whether we should go ground source or air source. And I can elaborate on that uh, later on. It's absolutely knackering. Um, I'm trying to work at the uh, uh, full time job as well. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's really fulfilling knowing that we're using the right um, materials, using local trades, people who are trusted and, and, um, uh, and they're all around us here in Cumbria. So we're, we're blessed with that knowledge and expertise and I'll leave it there, Tina and Emma. Brilliant, thank you, Phil. Phil, I wonder if you could just um, give us an indication of the time scale it's taken you to get from buying the property to now is that a bad question <laughs> yeah it is uh, i'll only tell you it's a bad question because builders are um you know they're, they're, they're hen's teeth at the moment um but we've been doing it mostly ourselves it's it's been uh it's been two years and i reckon we're we are halfway through mm -hmm. and it is clearly possible for diyers with some expert advice from contractors to do yeah. something like this Oh, uh, abs absolutely, definitely. If you bring in the teams, uh, Chris and his team work like, tro you know, just so hard. Um, I think the, the key is in making the correct decisions at the start. And I would say not rushing into things because actually you learn along the way. Um, I'm sure everyone in the, in the panel here is learning on the way as well. New information comes out about lots of different materials and new values and technology changes in terms of heating and heat pumps efficiencies. Um, so I, I, would, I would tend not to rush at anything. It may feel uh, really frustrating going slowly, but um, you make the correct decisions. So that's, that's, two, that's two years of weekends. Um, I mean, COVID has been dreadful for some people, but it's been a it hasn't made too much difference to us because we've been buried in holes and walls. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, Phil. So um, just a reminder, if that's prompted any of your questions to pop them into the Q&A and Tina's looking at those as we go on. Um, so uh, moving on, um, it's these real examples of retrofit that we know are so useful to everybody and your own projects. So um, for the last four years, um, we've been working on a project around retrofitting properties post uh, flood, post Storm Desmond. And in particular, with the benefit of funding from Historic England, uh, we've been looking at a property in Appleby. You may be interested to know that more listed buildings flooded in Appleby than anywhere else in the UK at Storm, during Storm Desmond. But not only that, there was a phenomenal number of non-listed buildings, which we still are know of as um, traditional heritage buildings, if you like. So with that funding and a very, very willing partner in Lake District Lime, we've had a unique opportunity to follow the retrofit of this property, 33 Chapel Street. And um, through the last few years, and particularly, it's been a particular half a rush and half a challenge, I think, Chris, to do that in the last year as well. So we produced a guide on retrofitting for flood resilience 
um, after Storm Desmond. And we're now finding that most people are, are referring to this as extreme weather. So it's not just the floods, it's the incredible heavy rain that overwhelms the rainwater goods that just wets the walls, the buildings don't dry out. So we are about to reissue uh, that guide for people who are doing their own retrofits um, including a lot learned from this project at Chapel Street and also we have the opportunity to include information and questions and the issues that people encounter from this evening so you're actually forming part of the um, refresh if you like of our flood resilience and weather resilience guide. So that guide will be issued soon and that's what um, I've been working on at CAFs over the last four years. Part of that project was also to run some training in retrofit and um, we were delighted to have James Innerdale to deliver some of that training. And James was also the conservation architect on this project in Chapel Street. So there's a lot of shared um, knowledge um, going around um, some of these projects. So James, um, let's start at the very uh, beginning. Why do traditional homes and pre-1920s housing stock need a different treatment to them when retrofitting? Thank you, Emma. Uh, evening, everybody. Uh, yeah, the reason that we, well, when you're looking at your property, you need to understand how it's constructed, how the fabric is put together and how the walls of that building particularly deal with water and moisture. And that's in a way why retrofitting and uh, extreme weather resilience are linked together because it's important that you need to understand how your building actually deals with moisture. And that is linked therefore to keeping the building dry. Um, and therefore you need to understand that in terms of considering any intervention that you're going to be uh, introducing into your building, be it from the point of view of repair or from the point of view of actually introducing insulation into the building, you need to understand the impact that is going to have on the performance and the fabric of the building. Uh, next slide, please, Rick. Uh, so there is a difference between traditionally constructed walls and your perhaps more modern cavity type construction uh, that uh, of sort of 20th century buildings. And a lot of you will be familiar with this, the idea of the breathing building. But just to talk about it again, traditionally constructed wall buildings, the walls are built of limestone, limestone sandstone brick, um, and lime mortar and they are all porous building materials um, and what happens is that when it rains or they acquire moisture within them uh, they absorb that moisture but that moisture is then allowed to evaporate out again the idea of uh, breathability. Compare that with your modern cavity wall type construction which actually works more on the basis of putting up barriers to water getting into the building in the first place using much more in the way of um, uh, non-porous, non-breathable uh, materials, cement renders, that sort of thing. So you're stopping water getting into the building, putting up layers. If it gets past one layer, uh, there's another layer that will stop it getting through to the inside of the building. And as two separate systems, they're fine. The trouble comes when you actually look to, when you mix the two together. So if you add a non-porous impermeable layer, on the outside of your traditionally constructed porous wall, you're stopping that wall from being able to evaporate the moisture out um, of the wall because water will get into that wall, be it through cracks uh, in the outside or through ground moisture rising up through the base of the wall or just through problems at the wall tops, that sort of thing. And that will compromise the way the building uh, the, the ability of the wall to evaporate the moisture out and that will lead to problems with dampness uh, within the wall and dampness in the house and potentially issues with erosion of the stonework as well. Uh, next slide please Rick. Um, which is why when we're thinking about also in the context of more extreme weather to make sure that the building is actually watertight and I don't when I say watertight we don't mean waterproof we mean that water is the the methods of dealing with the water are properly maintained making sure that the rut the gutters and the down pipes and the drains are all functioning properly and are not blocked and that the roof is properly maintained and not allowing water 
into the into the building and into the wall next one please rick because that's important because damp walls mean cold walls because damp walls conduct heat much quicker than warm dry dry walls so damp walls mean cold walls so if your building is damp in the first place you're starting from a bad position so you should be looking to actually make sure your wall is dry to start with and if you've got cold walls it then throws up issues with regard to condensation and mold growth and if you've got problems with asthma and that sort of thing there are potentially health issues associated um, with that sort of thing um, i will not talk there's a couple of lines there about reef if you are thinking about uh, improving the thermal performance of your building and we'll probably come back to this later but you do need to bear in mind uh, that you might need uh, permissions in terms of building regulations as part and parcel of that we may come back to that later uh, so uh, next slide please Rick uh, so very briefly in terms of introducing insulation into your building it's important to bear in mind how traditional buildings as I said, they breathe, but as they breathe, they need a degree of, of, of temperature within the wall to allow that evaporation of moisture to occur. So if you insulate your building, what is the implication of that on the ability of the wall to evaporate the moisture out? If you introduce insulation on the outside of the building, that is perhaps not a, uh, not a breathable form of insulation, uh, it's not a porous form of insulation it's going to trap moisture within the wall and it's potentially going to compromise uh, the ability of the wall to dry out there are obviously and we'll talk about them later breathable forms of external insulation and that's what you should be looking for you should be looking at breathable porous forms permeable forms of insulation that are compatible and will allow the traditional construction and performance of uh, the wall to actually continue and be maintained. Next one, please, Rick. And that also applies to internal insulation as well, because as well as uh, the, the heat coming into the wall to help with the evaporation process, there's also moisture vapor uh, from our general living in the building. Uh, so if you insulate on the inside face of the wall, you're going to be reducing the amount of heat that gets into the wall so the temperature of the wall is going to decrease and if you use the wrong sort of insulation that allows moisture vapor to get through the insulation to the wall it then hits what's a cold wall and you get problems with uh, condensation I appreciate this is getting a wee bit technical so ideally again you should be looking at using compatible breathable forms of insulation we'll talk about those um, in due course but um, uh, I think my time is well up there so I will finish at that particular point all right if you just want to move on a couple of slides um, Rick did, did you want yeah. to mention um, some information on mortars and finishes I know you've mentioned some breathability issues I think yes. this is a classic one for any uh, any building retrofit yeah I, I basically just just to make the point that <clears throat> the majority of the evaporation process happens through the actual mortar joint rather than the actual stonework or the brickwork because the lime mortar is of equal or greater porosity than the stone or brick around it so it's very important that the mortar joints are of a lime based mortar to allow the evaporation to occur through the joint rather than through the masonry because if it occurs through the masonry you get what you're seeing there in the bottom right hand corner when that happens it brings with it salts which crystallize on the surface of the uh, stonework or the brickwork and if it's a soft stone or a soft brick plan can lead as that quite dramatic image at the bottom right shows to quite significant erosion of the stonework so it's generally across the board understanding first of all understanding how your wall performs and working with that in terms of any intervention that you introduce into the building fantastic thank you james and just to remind you all again um no question is too simple. If there are issues of breathability and walls and things are having, getting you um, flummoxed at the moment, do please add a question in the chat for James and Chris, I'm sure will also be able to, to help with that. So keep popping those in. That's great. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, moving on to uh, Chapel Street again. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Chris Morfitt of Lake District Lime, star of the small screen, um, filmmaker extraordinaire now. <laughs> um, but also, uh, joking aside, uh, Chris and the co-owners of this property have been absolutely fantastic at uh, letting us crawl all over it to open it for open days. Um, and to show people before COVID uh, what they were actually doing in the building. And it's been absolutely fantastic. So Chris, just to start with, when you took on this property, just what sort of things did you have to do straight away? Could you move in and live in it or what had happened to the property beforehand? That's it. Hi there. No, not quite a mer. It was a charity shop. Uh, before we bought it, they uh, found another property in the town and, and moved on to bigger things. And um, when we got into it, uh, it had been previously flooded uh, throughout the decades. And um, it was also covered in, as you can see from the picture, a hard cement render. Um, inside, it was concrete floor over the old flags. Uh, it was gypsum walls and some cement renders where they'd previously chipped it off to hip height down below. And um, it was in a bit of a state, yeah, all the, all the fireplaces blocked up. Uh, there was not much airflow um, apart from a bit of draft through those windows, but uh, we had to set to getting stuck in really. Fantastic. So if you want to move on, um, Rick, this shows you Chris with the lovely nettle. With a haircut. Um, <laughs> with a haircut. <laughs> um, in the top floor of the property after it had been stripped back and all the light coming in through the roof and stripped back to basics. But um, that was the first of a series of vlogs, video logs that Chris uh, did for us with a filmmaker on the process. Um, all these films are now on our YouTube channel, so they're there for you to have a look at. But this was a good one because the number one was finally getting started. So Chris, I wonder if you could just um, explain some of the consents and permissions that you had to obtain before you started work, which is often common with a lot of these traditional buildings. That was right. So um, working alongside uh, some architects and also planners, we uh, got in touch with the council, which is Eden with us. Um, that also led on to the conservation officer at the time because there's a listing on the property. It's grade two. Um, so we, we had some on-site visits from those guys. Uh, it's always best to sort of involve them from the start. If you're unsure, and especially if there is a listing, it's best to get them on board, really, and work with them rather than against them. They're not as scary as <laughs> you may think. And sometimes they're not even concerned in the bit that you are. It, it might be a listing and the windows and not actually the structure of the building. Uh, so it is best to find out. Um, other than that, there was some structural issues behind the picture you can see uh, with the trusses that upstairs was actually um, a low ceiling. I couldn't stand up. The ceiling was just below the um, beam of the truss there. So we stripped that out, revealed the trusses and uh, a 200 year old roof, it needed some attention at the hip joints and bits like that. So uh, it, it's best to get those on board as well, especially with an old building like this. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. And I think one of the things that was needed as well was a um, flood risk uh, assessment because of the location of the property, which is often the case for anyone that's on a floodplain. And would the work do any uh, make any difference to that? Um, and yeah, listed building consent was was eventually um, forthcoming. And as James has, has indicated, building control as well from and the conservation officer. So there's there's quite a few different bits of permission. But as Chris says. Um, they're always worth getting on board early and trying to bring them along with the project. And I think you'll agree, Chris, not all of those um, parties understand traditional buildings and the materials that you might want to put in them. Yep, um, they're getting better. Um, with Eden, they've, they've certainly got on board now and the understanding of applying lime plasters and breathable plasters rather than... Uh, 
the, the good old one of tanking and, and dry lining and things like that, especially in these properties. So there is an understanding there and they are on board. Um, all I will say is you'll need your information from uh, your supplier. So um, they'll give you uh, like a, a U value and th that means that the council are happy with what you've specified on depths and, and insulation values. That's if you're using that type of product. Great, thanks Chris. If we could move on, uh, Rick. Um, the video of Chris laying this limecrete floor, which we also saw in Phil's house, was one of the most viewed ones um, that we've done through the whole project, which is quite, quite interesting. Um, I wonder if you could just very briefly, Chris, explain the processes um, and the layers that you've got here, sort of from the floor upwards or in the floor. Yeah, that's, that's right. So, um... In this property, we haven't got a picture of the existing floor, but it was uh, about six inches deep concrete, which is really enjoyable. So if you've, you've got to really set time aside to chip that out. It's, it's hard graft. Uh, you can't always get like a mini excavator in bits like that. So it, it's by hand with like a pneumatic drill that you can hire. Um, and that was to all chip out. Then you, you dig back the subsoil um, to get your layer of the GSL that you put down, but you've got to be really careful. Properties like this are built on basically big stones rolled into the bottom. Uh, they're your foundation stones, and you don't want to dig deeper than that. You can cause a whole uh, issue of problems. Uh, you'll hear the words underpinning and, and, and structural surveys, and you don't want to get involved with that. So it's always best to check um, and it, especially if you're digging it yourself to get advice. Um, but it's a case of digging down the subfloor, down to the depth. At, at this time, we had about 300 millimetres of um, the GSL in there, which is a foam glass insulation. Um, so we would lay down the geotextile, which is the white um, material you can see up the wall. So that's laid on the ground. And then you would pour in your GSL. You would then compact it with a whacker plate um, you'll put an awful lot more in than you think because once you compact it, it sinks down. Uh, once you've got to that point, and on this picture it hasn't, but you would wrap over the GSL. You, you don't have to necessarily, but you would wrap over the white product there, uh, like a pie crust over the top. Then you would, if you if you were going to lay your underfloor heating pipes, you don't necessarily have to, but if you're fitting that system, uh, then it can be incorporated. And then we have the mix on top, which is a lime creek slab, which involves a fiber. And it's normally a minimum depth of about three inches, but this one in particular was around about four to five. Um, and then you have a finished surface on top, whether it be flag, uh, timber or tile. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. It's an amazing recipe, isn't it? That goes into creating these floors and each layer um, performs its own specific task. So that's fantastic. So if anyone's got any questions for Chris on how the process um, of the retrofit, there is now um, somebody's moved in to the property. Uh, we haven't been able to go back and film, unfortunately, due to COVID, but we are hoping as part of our guide refresh that we'll be able to at least um, get some images of how it's looking um, and filmed very, very soon. Okay, if we could move on slide please lovely some of the um, insulation products that Chris has used at Chapel Street um, are exactly the type of products supplied by ecological building systems here in Cumbria um, so I'd just like to hand over to Penny and Ilias um, to explain which sort of EBS products are best suited for use on traditional buildings um, and a brief summary of them for the uninitiated Thank you very much, Emma. Um, as, as Emma says, we're based in the county and we've been here for 12 years and we are suppliers of natural insulations and airtight products, um, but we support our full product range through comprehensive training, um, which we have in our facilities um, just outside Carlisle, where we do retrofit upskilling and also passive house contractor training. Um, and we again support our products with a fantastic technical team and Ilias is part of that team and he's going to tell you a little bit more about our products. So if we could just move on and think Ilias has got some slides. Thank you, Benny. 
So yeah, basically, um, as a company, um, we supply uh, natural insulating materials. Uh, and as all um, the previous speakers uh, highlighted, that's very important for traditional um, uh, retrofits. So we have a, um, a range of, uh, of products that are suitable um, for these type of um, um, these types of structures, and actually we um, uh, we supply them as, as systems. So and uh, we, can, we can cover um, uh, the upgrade of all the building elements uh, of the fabric. So we upgrade the whole uh, fabric with uh, our products from walls to roofs and floors. So for example, for, for the walls, uh, we have um, uh, we supply um, a lime and cork based uh, insulating plaster uh, called diathonite that's been used um, in Chapel Street uh, in one floor. Um, this can be used as um, uh, a leveling coat as well as insulating um, uh, plaster um, uh, in one as one system. And the benefit of this um, uh, product is that um, you can follow the, um, the curves uh, of the wall and shape nice round corners and uh, keep that uh, traditional um, uh, aesthetic of the building and the features um, while at the same time uh, insulating the, uh, the building and dealing with the moisture, which we have to accept that moisture is there and we only have to deal with that. We cannot get rid of the moisture straight away. So. Um, uh, the diathonite is uh, is one of the uh, the main products we uh, we supply for that purpose. Now uh, the second uh, range of products is the wood fiber insulation. We hold the uh, the Gutex range. It's a wood fiber um, insulation that comes in in panels, um, so we can use that internally of the walls, uh, fully bonded onto the uh, onto the stone uh, or the brick, uh, the solid stone or solid brick. Once we have first removed all the impervious materials that um, were in place as gypsum plasters or hard cement plasters. And uh, by doing that, we, we ensure that uh, again, the moisture can safely evaporate and, um, and reach the equilibrium, uh, which, is, um, uh, which is our, our aim for that type of, of upgrades. For more severe uh, moisture um, uh, cases, we have the, um, uh, the next board on the bottom, the calcitherm calcium silicate board. Um, the calcium silicate board has the capacity to, um, to hold much, much more um, moisture than the other products. Actually, it can hold five times its weight in, um, um, in, in, in the actual water, in liquid water, which means that it can create a buffer for the moisture to, to travel through and safely evaporate uh, in very extreme uh, moisture um, uh, cases. Uh, so all of these products are suitable for uh, for the walls as systems. Uh, now next slide, please. Now that was for the for the walls. Now for the floors, um, we have um, suitable systems for for both cases for solid floors or for some suspended timber floors. For the solid floors, uh, we have a, sim, uh, a system that can be combined with what uh, Chris mentioned before with uh, uh, with the geocell. Uh, it's the diathonite, a, vari um, a variation of the diathonite plaster. It's called diathonite maceto, uh, and it is an insulating screed uh, based in, uh, in lime and cork, lime and cork mixture. Um, so you can use that um, either on the top of a concrete slab or in combination with the geocell um, under that. And for the suspended timber floors, which is uh, another case, uh, which is a, a pain, uh, because not only of the um, uh, of the lack of insulation, but also uh, because of the drafts. We have developed a system that incorporates um, um, breathable and vapor control layer uh, membranes for, uh, for controlling their leakages of the floors. And um, we can use uh, a flexible insulation um, that is a combination of hemp and jute. It's called thermohem combi jute. Uh, it's very flexible insulation that is friction fitted uh, and fully filling in between the, the joists. So we drape the, the blue membrane in between the joists and then we fully fill um, uh, in between the joists with the uh, thermal hemp jute and then we put the uh, vapor control layer over the top and then whatever finish uh, we'd like. And that's, uh, that type of floors is a pain because usually you cannot work from, uh, from underneath because the crawl space is very, very tight. Um, so that's that's why we developed that system. Of course, uh, if you have access from the bottom, it's, uh, it's even better and much more, uh, much easier to uh, to apply this system. And uh, next, please. 
And for the roofs, we can use, again, either the uh, good ex wood fiber and insulating products or the thermo uh, hemp jute uh, products. Uh, these come in um, rigid and flexible um, form, so denser or less dense boards uh, for, for different uh, applications. So if you insulate uh, at rafter level, you can either insulate in between the rafters with a flexible mat, either the uh, hemp jute or the uh, good ex wood fiber or over the top of the rafters with a more rigid board uh, or even, uh, even uh, under the rafters if uh, there is enough uh, head height there. And also you can use um, uh, these products for, uh, for cold uh, lofts uh, for insulate, insulating at ceiling level, again, either um, in between the joists or over the top of the joists. So yeah, these are the systems we uh, we supply and in combination with the uh, tightness systems, these uh, improve hugely the fabric safely um, by also making sure that the moisture is getting out. And of course, if you have any questions, we can uh, have, a, uh, as Penny mentioned, a great technical team. So you can uh, drop us an email and uh, hopefully we can answer your questions. Thank you very much, Ilias and yeah, Penny. Much. Um, and talking of answering questions, that's what we're about to do now. God, you'd think this was thrown together, wouldn't you? Okay, so Tina, um, have you been able to uh, group the questions or would you like me to just run through the q and I see people have been answering the questions already. Yes, I can. Well, what I've got is I have grouped some of the questions. So I thought we would perhaps go with the groups that exist already. But if you're still thinking of questions, do drop them in. We'll get through as many as we possibly can. And um, but keep putting them in and some of the team will type their answers to the questions. We'll still bring them up if, if we've got time. Um, but I thought walls and floors were a very popular area. So I thought we might well start with walls. And Nick asked a question which Ilias answered about um, just to do with a typical 500 mil thick stone wall, what you value is achievable with five millimeters of a product, say diathenite. And um, Ilias has replied that around um, 0.5 to 0.6, what, well, Ilias, do you, do you want to say just a quick word about that one, Ilias? Yeah, what I mean. Whatever insulation you uh, you apply, um, the law of diminishing returns uh, applies to. Uh, so you could, of course, add more insulation, uh, but typically uh, this type of uh, of constructions we we suggest um, to again by insulating more internally, you you create more problems with the moisture because the, the cold the, interf the, the the interface between the existing wall and the uh, insulation becomes colder. So the interstitial condensation issues there are and stronger. Um, so I would say 50, 60, 70 millimeters of insulation um, would be sufficient. And this would improve the, uh, the overall performance of the wall by maybe four times. So you, you basically um, um, ensure that the comfort uh, is fine. Uh, of course, you can go uh, lower with the U values and you, can, you cannot feel that though. You can feel that in your pocket because you're going to be paying uh, uh, less, but you know, in terms of the comfort, I think uh, going down to 0.5 or 0.6 is uh, is reasonable. So uh, the question about this thickness uh, apparently is because of that, because usually that's the type, that's the thickness so we um, uh, we uh, we apply. So yeah. Thanks, Elias. Uh, thank you, thank you. So staying on the same theme, a couple of questions have been answered, so I'll perhaps skip over those because they've been answered in the Q&A, so hopefully everyone can see them, but I can come back to them. But some questions I haven't yet seen answered. Should, as is Chris asked this question, should external lime mortar pointing be flush with the stone or sit back from the stone? Should we answer that? Chris, ask that too. Perhaps you can you tackle doing? that one, Chris. Yep, yeah, so you would bring it flush with the stone. Um, it's like weather struck pointing. Um, some buildings though, depending on the type of stone that it's constructed with or the type of build style, it would warrant more than just pointing, uh, especially if it gets the weather. Um, so if the person would like to possibly elaborate or they can contact and they can help out. Um, 
But yeah, generally get the lime right out flush with the stone. It helps shed off the water. You don't want any uh, water sitting on ledges. It, it needs to be cast off from the stone. Brilliant, thank you. And another one, um, please advise about hempcrete for ex as external wall insulation. You should put that to Emma. I, uh, James, would you I'll, like to, uh, James well, Adele? It's, it's not hempcrete. Hempcrete is a form of limecrete which is used for floor construction, but there is um, various forms of external wall insulation that have uh, insulants within them. So there is a, a sort of hemp lime, and I think there's an external, there's a cork, I think, um, uh, a cork external uh, form of wall insulation. Um, as far as I'm aware, the internal uh, hemp lime insulation that Eden lime, um, Eden hop lime use cannot be used at the moment externally, but I know there are including um, products from Ecological that yeah, I think you can use uh, as an external form of wall insulation. I just want to say a quick word, just going back a step in terms of the question about lime mortars and joints and what Chris said, the purpose of external wall insulation, well, external render is very important uh, in terms of the ability of the wall to dry out uh, because the, the uh, drying out happens, as I said, through the lime. And if you then cover the whole of the external face of your, basically, if you are covering the external face of your building with lime, you're increasing the ability of the wall to dry out. You're speeding it up, basically. The put a, uh, rendering externally in lime actually helps with the drying out of the building. It's important if you've got it. It's important thing to to maintain it. And if there is the option to introduce insulation into that as part and parcel of it, then that's a double win, really. Okay. Thanks, James. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Elias, on external wall insulation and the, the things you'd recommend? Yeah, as James uh, mentioned, uh, we, we supply uh, the variations of diethanite, the diethanite evolution, which is suitable for external view and um, yeah, protecting the fabric as well as insulating at the same time with a breathable product is, is a good, uh, good option. So the di diathanate evolution is the one to use on external wall insulation. Yeah. Is that one suitable for being submerged in water? So flood resilience, for example? No, not really. None of them. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because, I mean, all these products, because they're very capillary active, very absorptive, shouldn't be uh, in direct contact with, uh, with, um, with water. Mm -hmm. So even at, at the base, it's a speci uh, like the specific detail we suggest it shouldn't be kind of touching the uh, touching the ground because otherwise it uh, very actively absorbs the water and something we, we don't want to. Yeah, I mean that at at Chapel Street, that's something that we had discussions about in terms of uh, a ground floor in the area where it, the flooding was. There was potential for future flooding. We weren't unfortunately able to, other than with the limecrete floor, but in terms of the wall plaster, we weren't actually able to introduce any insulation in the wall plaster uh, within the flood zone up to the height of the flood water internally. Uh, but we could use lime plaster because obviously the lime plaster maintains its integrity and dries out after flooding. So it was good that it was lime mortar, but we couldn't introduce insulation uh, in, into the uh, wall plaster at lower levels. Just to add on, um, because we discussed about uh, but the specific um, application, I mean, we and we refer to the manufacturer for that. And as James said, the integrity of the product would be fine after drying, but uh, you'll never sure about contaminants and you know other substances that may as a remainder. So yeah, just finger crossed, you know, <laughs> whatever you use there. Well, it's, uh, it's very challenging. Absolutely. So there was a question here as well that says we were advised not to point the exterior side of our house walls as they are open stonework work and should be allowed to breathe. Uh, so do you agree that this is true in some cases? I think, James, you've probably just said it can be rendered. Um, yeah, that's, as I said, the evaporation mostly occurs through the joint and not through the stonework. 
So that's a misunderstanding of how a traditional constructed wall actually evaporates the moisture out. And the same person asked, is anti-mould paint a bad idea externally? Most anti-mould, well, it depends what, which one it is, but most of them are film-based paints, uh, although there are, yeah, it depends on the paint, unfortunately, without knowing what partic which particular paint. Uh, it should be whatever you're using externally, if you're using it in, in combination with, well, it, it should really be a breathable based paint externally. Um, but it depends what the paint is. It would also be a case if, you, if you're thinking that you're needing to use that sort of product, then what's causing that? Yeah. Uh, what, what, what pointing is in the wall or what render is on the wall? Um, if you if it's going mouldy, then there's, there's there's a problem before that, and, and painting that sort of product on isn't solving the problem. It's yeah. just masking it. <laughs> so I would possibly take a look at what was actually on the wall first before attempting that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think okay. that's a that's a very good point, Chris. Mm. Yeah. There are available in the market uh, water repellent products that are uh, vapor open. Uh, but basically don't create a film on the wall, but they essentially um, reduce the surface tension. So the water droplets, instead of staying on the wall and gradually being absorbed, they slip down the wall. So that kind of protects um, the wall. Um, yeah, these are siloxan based uh, products. Uh, we, we supply one of these, the BKK Eco. There are other in the market as well. Um, but yeah, you can do that. But first of all, as Chris said, the most important is repointing, securing all the uh, the joints, uh, the, the junctions, uh, and uh, all that before you try and further reduce the absorptivity of the wall. And I just make a point to say that we're we're talking generally about traditionally constructed walls as if they're all the same, and they're not. Um, and it's important to understand how what your wall is constructed, how well it's constructed, where it is in terms of its how high up, you know, is it is it on the top of one of the fells or is it low down in the valley? What's the orientation? Does it get the sun? All of those sorts of things will affect your choice in terms of the material, even if you use breathable materials, how you approach it and the, the type of material you, you use. You need to sort of really understand what you've got first before the diving in, I think, which, yeah. Sorry, could I can I just sorry? Could I just add it because I see the anti mold was on the inside that um, a company called Auro A U R O uh, do do an anti mold um, that their natural natural paint provider. So it might be worth looking on the Auro UK website for anti mold paints. Okay, that's great. Uh, can I can I add to that? Yesterday I was actually doing a home audit on somebody else's house and they had a mold problem we eventually tracked it down because it it wasn't where i thought it should be they eventually tracked it down to the gutter outside was leaking so that's normally a very simple solution but it will be something you start at the top and you work down where's the water coming from and that's what it was there's a there's a bend in the in the downpipe and it was blocked Okay. Yeah, very simple solutions often. Yeah, start at the top and work down is very good advice. Thank you, James. Phil, would you like to come in on that one? Yeah, it's just um, just in terms of that mould and damp, it, it's often you, you obviously look to the closest place to where the damp is to find the problem. So, so James Wargrove there mentioned about a gutter. Uh, it was interesting in our case that um, we'd find mould and blistering on the gypsum plaster um, sort of in the bottom right hand corner of the of the house or room um, but actually when we removed all the gypsum um, you would find that it come down the chimney breast and then it had trapped right the way across to the bottom right hand corner of the room so don't always think that um, damp and rain and water uh, goes in a in a in a vertical axis it <laughs> often tracks and that's that's the problem we're trying to find out the source of it yeah absolutely okay right. okay so, well a few more questions on the subject of walls before we move away so that we can cover some other things but we've got simon and jack said um with cement render on some of our external walls no problems with visible damp but 
we think it's because of the lack of air tightness um, and just wondering if there's any solution that doesn't involve removing the render or is a moisture problem inevitable if we improve the air tightness? Um, my comment on that is that it, it depends what they're thinking of doing. If they're thinking about walls and insulating internally, think about the implications of that in that if you're insulating internally, as I said before, you're reducing the amount of heat that's coming from the house into the wall. And although that wall may now at the moment not be presenting problems with dampness, despite the fact that it's got a cement render on the outside, if you reduce the heat coming into that wall, actually you might create problems with dampness within the wall because you've reduced the heat within the, coming into the wall and therefore its ability to dry out. So think carefully about that. I would think about using a breathable form of insulation on the inside in that instance, because if you are reducing the temperature of the wall and therefore potentially creating issues with more in the way of entrapped moisture, having a breathable form of insulation on the inside will enable that moisture to evaporate to the inside of the property and eventually vent ventilate out. So again, despite the fact that you've got a, a non-porous render externally, actually use of a breathable insulation inside is going to be quite critical in terms of the performance of the wall. And James, relating to that, another question really on a very similar theme, is dry lining interior surfaces of external stone walls a bad idea? When could you do it? Uh, depends what you dry line it with. It's the same sort of, I mean, in, in essence, internal wall, in, internal wall insulation is a form of dry lining. And you need to, yeah, uh, basically I would be recommending a, a breathable form of uh, insulation uh, if if it was something that would be affordable, that would be the way to go. If you had the option. I had something like that. I mean, whatever the form of insulation, as James said, uh, you use internally, what's important is to be fully bonded to, to the substrate, to, to the stone or the brick. Uh, because if any gaps are left between the insulation and the, um, the very cold now, after being insulated, existing um, substrate. Mm -hmm. uh, so all these pockets of air are very humid in there and are going to condense and mold is gonna be created there. And yeah, so uh, that's it's very important, uh, whatever you uh, use to fully bond it, not don't end up anything there. Okay. Can we move um, up to roofs, Tina? Yes, yes. So, um, or we might come back um, to walls if we've got enough time. Okay. So in terms of roofs, I've got one question here from Phil about an old house with a very old slate roof that needs replacing. The nails have rusted and so on. What do you recommend regarding membranes, loft insulation and so on? At the moment, the loft is drafty but dry, which carries the damp away. Um, but what, what would you recommend perhaps for the future? Phil, have you looked at anything in particular for loft insulation? Um. Well, we're using one of the um, uh, one of the sheets wall type insulations, and um, which is breathable, and it, it, it does keep its loft. Um, that's why sheep have wool coats, really. Um, but it it you know it is more expensive. But I you know we looked we looked at the expense in terms of what we what we'd spent on the entire house, and actually the. You know, for many of the products that, that, that we're talking about here, there is a bit more expense, not always. But I think you have to put it against what you're trying to achieve in your home and what you've actually spent on your home. And if you've spent 150, 250, 350 or more thousand pounds and you're spending an extra 800 pounds on, on a markup on loft insulation and it's going to be breathable and it's lasting and it's natural, then I think it's, uh, you know, in comparison, it's, it's money well spent. So we, we um, I, I mentioned that we'd parged the roof. It was originally parged and someone asked a question there about parging the roof. What is parge? So it was a means, an old means of keeping sort of slates from, from rattling, um, keeping them in place. It offers a little bit of secondary 
sort of um, waterproofing in a way um, in case there's any holes in there. So we've got an open loft and then we have um, sheep's wool insulation in between um, the roof joists. But I would say, um, I, know it in, I know it sort of uh, moves away from traditional building, but if you are replacing a roof with traditional slates um, and it is the right orientation, then actually the cost of photovoltaic panels um, if you're not in a conservation area necessarily, or, or, or there's no restrictions on them, um, it may also be worth considering when you replace your slates, if you don't have PV of, of, of an integrated system. Sorry, a little bit of a divergence into renewable energy there, Emma. That's great. Thank you, Phil. And we do have um, another event coming up soon on renewables in the home. So those of you that have posted, I spotted a couple of questions about um, renewable energy. So there'll be much more information um, in our next event, which I think is on the 11th of May, Tina, if I'm right. That's right. Yes. Um, and just yes. on that, I think um, I'd like to just ask Chris if he could summarise what you'd used in the roof at Chapel Street and then perhaps ask uh, James Woolgrove how important um, roof and ceiling insulation is compared to other surfaces in terms of your energy efficiency and carbon saving. So Chris, what did you use at Chapel Street? Yep, so when we stripped our uh, roof, we completely took off the Westmoreland slate. So it's a, they're a diminishing slate as well. I'd always advise to keep that slate. I know it costs a bit more, but it's far superior to, to most things. So kind of don't let your roofer try and swap you for something. Um, they, they take a bit more time, uh, but, but they sit well on the roof. So that there's that way. But we also stripped the roof completely, denailed all the rafters, replaced, and then we fit a wood fibre board over the top. So it was like a sarking board over the top. Then we double latted, which involved a, a membrane as well, a breathable membrane, and then slated back with the Westmoreland slate. Um, it's not often I get asked to put back slates without a membrane or, or parging. That, that's great if the roof's existing and it's in, in good order, then it is probably best just to use the parging. It, it also acts, it stops condensation as well because it absorbs the moisture. So it's a great system, but if you were going to renew a roof, then the wood fibre board over the top, um, counter batten a felt, and then you slate it back. And you can also, underneath the rafters, you can even place it in between if you've got an air gap, and then underneath um, a rigid board again, and you can, you can skim onto that as well. So you've got, in essence, a fully breathable roof. Thanks, Chris. That's great. So, James uh, Wilgrove, if if, uh, if people are going to invest in insulation in any form, is is the roof and the ceiling the best place to put it? Absolutely, the best place. We're recommending about four hundred millimeters, and just put it in, but put it in carefully. Make sure that you've maintained your ventilation under the eaves, so that air can flow under the roof, but also. If somebody goes up there, make sure they don't throw all the insulation off to one side. I've been in quite a few lofts recently where they had 300 millimetres, but they had 600 millimetres on one side and 50 millimetres down the middle. And the other thing I see a lot of is people storing boxes or something else up there. And they put in 300 millimetres of insulation and then put a box on top and flatten it. That doesn't work. So if you do need loft storage, make sure you've got a proper loft storage platform over the 400 millimetres of insulation. But it really is the most effective insulation we can put in. Brilliant. Thank you. Right, Tina, have we got any more? We've got plenty questions? more, actually. But have some, we got roof many... questions or are we? Um, I think moving on to on... Windows? I was going to ask a general question, which might have a roof, roof element in it, which is, what is the panel's experience on thermal bridging and air tightness? Which is an everything question, really. Oh, thermal bridging. Who wants to handle that one? James, are you, James in a dale, are you leaping into that technical? You're on mute at the moment. And then Thank perhaps Ian yes. can contribute yeah. as well. Uh, just to make just so people may not be aware what thermal bridging is it's sort of it's 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 a single material element through a wall which 
inevitably is therefore going to be on the inter internal surface is going to be colder than perhaps the rest of the wall and potentially moisture vapor from us occupying the house condenses on that cold surface and creates condensation and potential for mold, mold growth. Um, and Elias mentioned earlier the issues of condensation, the, the issue associated with if you insulate a wall to a certain thickness, you need to, um, the comparison between the surface temperature of that insulated wall and, and say a window reveal next to it is going to, there's going to be a greater contrast between the two, between the two. So window, if you insulate walls but not the reveals those reveals all of a sudden become thermal cold bridges and have potential for uh, condensation and mold growth so if you're insulating the internal face of your wall you also need to think about uh, insulating the reveals not necessarily to the same thickness but to a degree so you don't create thermal bridges and cold bridges at the reveals if you start on that, uh, James, a couple of, uh, of, of other uh, very significant thermal bridges we, we meet in retrofits are, except for that, which is the most significant, as you said, the window reveals, is the intermediate floor junctions. Mm -hmm. It's difficult mm -hmm. to either lift the boards or, uh, you know, or, the, or the ceiling, so there's, there's difficult access there, but it's, it's very important, if possible, to be insulated as well, to maintain that continuity from, from floor to floor, from level to level. And also the abutments of uh, the partition walls onto the external walls. That's, that's easier to, to be mitigated if you return uh, the insulation along the direction of the, um, uh, of the partition wall, even if it's thinner, um, for about, I don't know, maybe half a meter. So kind of create a collar on both sides of the partition walls, then that will uh, significantly improve that uh, thermal bridge there. So it's the window reveals, those abutments, and the intermediate floor junctions are the, the most um, uh, common thermal bridges that by this type of uh, constructions. And the thermal bridges become much, much worse the more insulation you add. So the thicker the insulation, the more, the more significant these thermal bridges become. So sometimes it's, it's better if you, uh, if you uh, invest in, uh, in mitigating the thermal bridges, so add some costs there, lifting the floorboards and insulating there, rather than increasing the insulation uh, thickness and just leave those cold bridges um, uh, exposed. So yeah, it's, it's always a balance. Great, thank you. That's some really good advice. Shall we move okay. to windows? Yes, well, or before windows, I was just thinking with the thermal bridges, there's a related question, which is what would be a target humidity level you could expect in a 1900 construction? Because obviously the humidity level on the thermal bridges are um, related. When the humidity goes up, the, the thermal bridges will become more of a problem. So perhaps if someone would like to say a little bit about internal humidity levels. Um. Just to say, if a traditionally constructed property is performing as it should, the humidity level should not be particularly high. They should be low because the lime plaster and the breathable, uh, the, the lime plaster and the breathable insulation should be acting as a buffer to actually control the humidity levels within the property. So if you've got high humidity levels within the property, then there is potentially something else going on there in terms of what is happening within the building so uh, uh, when you get up to 80 percent you know you've got issues with potential for more growth and fungal decay and all those sorts of bits and pieces so uh, if the wall if the building is performing as it should then you wouldn't be getting up to those sorts of levels by any stretch of the imagination and if you're concerned that you've got high humidity levels then you need to try and understand why okay all right, so moving on to windows, we've got two questions on windows, one of which has already been touched on with an answer. So perhaps we could start with the um, other question, which is about asking about whether the home audits consider embodied carbon of retrofit measures um, and the environmental product description of the materials. And specifically thinking about triple glazing, um, whether triple glazing actually results in carbon savings because the embodied carbon is greater than with a double glazed window, for example. 
Yeah, we'd like to take that. James Walgrove, would you like to? Yeah, as somebody who, in? yeah, as somebody who's actually going out and doing the audits, it's certainly the embodied carbon is certainly there. It's the software doesn't necessarily cope with it, but the software in that thing does, <laughs> because I am aware of the embodied carbon in manufacturing new windows, and I will certainly be looking at what is the effective way of doing it. There's a house recently where the windows weren't quite what we would ideally have put in, but they'd been put in recently. So we said, let those windows stay their lifetime. If we replace them now, you will never get payback for them in terms of carbon or money. So keep what's there is the sensible proof. We, we have to be pragmatic. We know when we're doing the, these surveys that you have a budget as, as well, both carbon and financial. So yeah, that's how we deal with it. Great, thank you, James. And just a quick one possibly to Chris or James or anyone who's found someone who does um, heritage windows that are double or triple glazed. Um, triple glazed uh, if, if you're looking at it from the context of listed buildings then you're not going to get permission for triple glazing if you've got historic windows then think about secondary glazing as a preference to double glazing um, it might be a cheaper option than stripping out all the perfectly good single glazed windows anyway um, also think about upgrading the existing windows, um, just sort of maintaining them and upgrading them. Um, there are obviously uh, various systems out there, the thin, slim light and similar type of uh, 464, 484 type double glazed units. There are issues with those, however, in terms of their longevity. Uh, so if you are looking from the point of view of embodied carbon and cost and all that sort of thing, they do have less longevity to them. Um, there are alternative options. Um, I have in the past used double glazing where, and I can't believe I'm saying this, I've put spaces between the double glazed units and um, false glazing bars externally and internally, but they, uh, in terms of their performance, they are more effective in terms of their th formal thermal performance than slim light units and have a longer longevity of life. All right, thank you, James. Yeah, and, uh, just at Chapel Street, we, um, we've we kept the glazed windows. Uh, they're just single glazed. We had a chap restore them, and it's often a far better option to do that than think, oh, I need to rip these out. There's a there's a sill rotten or there's a side gone or there's other weights are wonky or it doesn't lift because someone's covered it in paint. Um, again, you'll have to, you'll have to book ahead for someone with that skill of fixing them, but it was far more cost effective. I've got all the original windows. I didn't throw any of them away and um, they all work little draft excluders, things like that. And for glazing, uh, James and I discussed secondary glazing and things like that. Um, but <coughs> Another option is just a sh like shutters um, of a night and, and they're also a good way of doing bits, just some timber shutters. As of yet, I've not got mine sorted on Chapel Street, but with the insulation products I've used, it's pretty warm as it is and the draft's quite a good thing uh, anyway in an old building. Um, so that's what I found. But yeah, don't always think it, it's ruined. That There's people out there that can fix them and they just look like new and work like new. Thank you. I think we're looking at the time, Emma. I think mm -hmm. we're going to need to begin to wrap up. But if, yeah. if Rick can bring the presentation back up, um, for those of you who, where we haven't managed to answer your questions, there is an option um, which we've described on the next slide um, where we can answer certain advice call certain calls general advice calls with one of our advisors so if you want to get in touch with us we can do that and that is for free for a short advice call uh, so so please do get in touch if you if we haven't managed to answer your question today but you think we might be able to through a short advice call 
So moving on to, so we'll finish on time, moving on to the next slide. I'd like very quickly just to run, rerun the poll. Um, so I'm going to go to the second poll. It's the same questions, but we're just interested in knowing whether for, for anyone that's given you a little bit more information, has it changed um, where you feel you're at with, with traditional buildings and their retrofit options? Um, or whether it stayed the same. It's absolutely fine. This is just for our information. We're interested to know. And once you've done the poll, if, if Rick, you could go on to the next slide. We're really interested to know, um, we've got one question we'd like to ask you and we'd like to put the answers in the chat. So on the next slide, that question, um, can we go on to the next slide? Perhaps not while the poll's up. Oh, yes. Ah, that's very possible. No, it's okay. okay. We're there. Okay. Yes. So the final question um, after, the, after you've completed the poll is, if we run more events like this one, what topics would you most like us to cover? And particularly the ones we haven't managed to answer today, whether it's cavity walls, whether it's, um, obviously, we've got this renewables one coming up very soon, but any other specific um, topics that you would like us to, to cover in an event or any of our training courses in the future. So thank you for that. I'm going to end the polling. And just to say that in terms of the results, I think people generally feel that they've, some people who came into this with less information um, have, have picked up some useful information to, to get them started. And I think the second question hasn't hasn't changed much, but thank you very much for those. We're going to use that information for for our sort of for our further information. Would you like to move on to the next slide, please, Rick? And over to Emma. Okay. So just before we finish, there is one very important uh, message that I would like to share with you, because there is so much that we need to do in the race to zero carbon, which is what us at CAFs are all about in Cumbria. We've just launched an appeal on Earth Day last week to raise 5,000 pounds by this Thursday. So if you did enjoy this evening, if you feel you've got something out of it for your property and would like to help secure the future of Cumbria, then please, if you can give what you can to our CAF's Big Give Appeal, we would be very grateful and every pound donated will be match funded. You can find the Big Give Donate button if you Google CAF's Big Give and um, you can find it also on our website. So every um, pound donated by Thursday will generate two pounds so that we can get to our fabulous uh, target. We will keep the information in the chat and the questions so um, we will uh, be able to look at other events that we are going to run. One important point that I think um, James uh, Innerdale has just mentioned is that if you are looking at more information on some of the subjects discussed this evening, do have a look at the SPAB Old House Eco Handbook, which is um, still um, very informative and very valid. Okay, could we move to the last slide then? Thank you, Rick. Um, so I would just like to say a very, very big thank you to all our panelists, um, phenomenal body of expertise that we have um, here in Cumbria, which is amazing. Thank you all for your time and for sharing your independence and all that information. Uh, thank you all in the audience out there for coming along this evening and for contributing with all your fabulous questions. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you'll join us next time to talk about renewables for the home, which is on 11th of May at 7pm. And there are our contact details um, if you want to find out more information or you've got any further questions. Uh, so without further ado, I will hope you enjoy the rest of your evenings and thank you all very much for joining us this evening.